just started this. And it was a, a, a kind of um, whimsical, in some ways, uh, serious, but also whimsical, in some ways, experiment. Uh, when, we, when we brought a group of people here together in 1999, and um, we, we now call the sessions that we do, we do every year a, a political session for journalists and activists and a filmmaking session uh, with the Center for Independent Documentary. And, um, and we, um, before we, we kind of knew what we were, how we were going to do it, we, we thought, well, let's just invite some people. You know, some people we know or sort of know or we came across in ways that were interesting. And, and we had this idea that we wanted to cross generations and we wanted to cross craft. We wanted people who were journalists and activists. And we wanted to think about political issues and we wanted to think about media. And, and Andy used to have a, a line that he used to ask, can you have a left media without a left movement? And that was always a question that, you know, interns at the nation would mull over. And it was something that animated this uh, to some extent. And we, we didn't really know how to start. And so we just thought, well, let's just start. And the one thing we did know was how to sort of have a party. <laughs> and we thought, well, the worst thing that can happen is that everyone will have a good time. Yeah. And um, and a lot more than a good time happened because uh, we all had a fabulous time. Um, but we also launched this project, which for now 15 years has brought people from all over the country and the world together uh, to think deeply and to live expressively and to take a break from their ordinary life and um, and 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 feel the joy of politics. And we've also made some lifelong friends uh, who we otherwise wouldn't have. And so it is um, just a tremendous, tremendous thrill uh, tonight to have one of those people. Um, Jennifer Berkshire was part of the original group of campers, um, and we call them campers, I mean it's not really <laughs> camp, but, uh, and at that time, you know, because it was this experimental thing, you know, we, we didn't, now we call it like K1, K2, this is K26, you know, cop kind 26, but at that time we really weren't into that, and so then Jennifer coined this term, well, that they were pre-K. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but she's just uh, really a marvel, um, I mean, a really uh, funny, brilliant person, and um, a person who is very um, dear to our hearts, and um, so we thought, why not? Um, in this week where we're talking about um, borders and we're talking about border lines and the border lines and the lines that d that separate us and that um, and that create divisions um, and, and to think about that broadly um, why not bring someone back who has thought of quite a lot about education and um, and who's always entertaining and who we love to see and so I give you Jennifer Berkshire mentioned that as a result of our year pre-K that um, uh, one of the, uh, they had the experiment and they figured out what worked and what didn't work and then they immediately instituted a lot of behavioral rules. <laughs> and the, the camp was never the same again and frankly that was probably best for everyone. <laughs> so, um, so I'm going to talk about education, and since that's our topic, I thought it would really only be fitting if we started with a little field trip. So in our minds, we're going to leave Vermont, nice cool breeze, and we're headed to Harlem. We're going to a school called Democracy Prep. And if anyone here reads The New Yorker, you might have read about Democracy yes. Prep in the most recent issue. Um, in the Talk of the Town section, a writer named Ian Frazier has a... a glowing piece about uh, Democracy Prep's first graduating class. And he, he goes, he attends their, their graduation ceremony at the Apollo Theater, and he's just blown away. He's blown away by a number of things. There are 44 members of the graduating class. Um, all of them are going to college. He also really likes, he's impressed by all the dignitaries that are there. Um, ban Ki-moon drops by from the, uh, from, the, um, uh, from the United Nations. 
And he's also, uh, Ian Frazier also really likes the fact that all the kids in the school have learned how to speak Korean. And isn't this impressive? So this happens to be, um, I'm you know, fascinated by the subject of urban education. And so I, when I read this, I thought, well, gosh, you know, it's interesting. There's a lot of stuff that he's not telling you. And I wonder you know, if, I don't want to make assumptions about the sort of people that subscribe to The New Yorker. Um, I happen to be one of them. But it is among our nation's whitest publication, rivaled perhaps only by The New York Review of Books. But if you know, one could read this story about uh, kids going to college and learning a foreign language and have it feel very familiar, right? That if, you're, if you occupy a certain class position, this all feels very familiar and natural. So what he doesn't mention, he, doesn't, he fails to mention some specific things. For example, uh, Korean is the only language offered at the school, and the kids are required to take it. But the big thing he doesn't tell you is that this is a very particular kind of school that's more and more popular in urban areas called a no-excuses school. Um, the general philosophy behind a no-excuses school is that Whatever is happening in the community in which a kid, a student, and his school is based, whatever's going on in his life is no excuse for him or her not being able to achieve at the highest level. And that shapes everything about his education experience, everything about the way that he's taught, and everything that's expected of him. So I tell you this, I take you on this field trip as a lead end to what I think of as kind of three consensies, if that's a word. Um, is that a word, Joanne? I, I don't know, it's nice. Um, <laughs> um, we're, we're in an interesting moment because um, suddenly we're in broad agreement about a number of things without ever really having had any kind of discussion or vote or back and forth. So the first thing that we're all in agreement um, about is that absolutely everyone must go to college. Right? There, is, there is no alternative, you must go to college. And that really, we're going to deploy a whatever it takes approach to get you to college. Number two is that there is now uh, uh, quite a broad consensus among elites. And by elites, I'm talking about everyone from politicians to the editorial boards at newspapers. I'm talking about academics and foundation heads. I'm talking about... Uh, public figures, entertainers, um, and really just about everyone you can imagine. And they've reached this consensus that poor minority students need to be educated in a very particular way. And what's interesting about this consensus is one, how broad it is, and two, how um, incredibly the specific the vision is about the kind of education. So I'm going to um, take you through it a little bit. Because I personally think this is very interesting. Um, so the first, uh, the first thing that everyone agrees on is that poor minority kids, black and brown kids, um, particularly in an urban setting, need a really, really long school day. Nine and a half, ten hours, right? <laughs> so democracy prep in Harlem, they start at 7.30, they go to 4.30. That's just the regular part of the day. Um, they'll routinely stay for two extra hours for either extracurriculars, but more likely tutoring, right? Because that that climb to college is going to be long and hard, and it's going to take um, it's going to take a lot of hours. And this is not this long day is not just for middle and high schoolers. Um, in Boston, where we're in the throes of a heated mayoral contest, um, the many uh, uh, candidates. Um, all are, are unanimous in agreeing that these schools are outstanding and we must open as many of them as possible. And one of our, um, uh, the Boston Globe feels the same way and a columnist was, wrote a very uh, a raving column about one of the mayoral candidates and he was so impressed that the candidate had started one of these schools. Um, it just opened last year. It's got a nine and a half hour school day for kindergartners and first graders. And it wasn't, you know, wasn't this great. So you've got your really long day, but even with the really long day, there is not a moment to be wasted in the effort, you know, to in that long slog to college. And so what you'll find, and this includes a democracy prep, is that um, there's a lot of emphasis on uh, stopwatches and timers. 
And so um, when kids transition between activities in the classroom, the teacher will routinely do a countdown, 10, 9, 8. And um, um, same with the transition between classes. Um, it's very important that no time be wasted. So um, kids move from class to class in what are called straight silent lines. And often the lines are marked on the hallway. Um, and the thinking behind this, and this is really important, um, the whole idea is that you want to you want to prevent disruption as much as you can. And the analogy that I would use is that this approach to education is really kind of the equivalent of broken windows policing. And it starts with the idea that the biggest hurdle these students face in their long slog to college is discipline issues. And if anyone's worked in a urban school setting, you know this is a real thing. But the other obstacle they face is that they need to learn to self-regulate and that unless there's an elaborate architecture of reward and punishment in place, they'll make, the, they'll make poor choices. And before you know it, you've got the, you know, it starts with a broken window, um, and you've got the, you know, what could seem like a really small thing, dropping a pencil, having your shirt untucked, it leads to um, the educational equivalent of the abandoned house on fire. Right? And so all these schools have these very, very well-defined architectures of reward and punishment. And often they'll use a dollar-based system. So um, at Democracy Prep, they use something called dream dollars. And I don't remember exact, dream stands for discipline, respect, um, enthusiasm. I don't remember what the A ambition. stands for. Ambition, maturity. And so every part of your day Every action you take within the academic setting is pegged to a reward or a punishment. And so um, do something good, earn a dream dollar. Do something bad, get that dream dollar taken away. Um, and, but the, the bad could just be like dropping a pencil or... And the, the idea is that by, um, by seeing that every one of your choices is pegged to a system of of rewards and demerits that you will then um, take this into your inner core and you'll stop making such poor choices. Um, this, uh, this goes all the way back. The most popular of these schools, the fastest growing are the, the ones for really young kids because the thinking is, well, you know, if they learn this early, then it's really not such a, um, a huge hurdle. Um, so um, so the, the system of rewards and punishment, the dream, the dream dollars. Um, the, other, the last part of this is that these poor minority kids require a very specific way of being taught. And um, it's, this is now has taken over the, uh, the, uh, these schools in an urban setting and is even starting to move into the suburbs. And it's called slant. It comes out of the KIPP schools, as a lot of this stuff does. And slant basically is just, um, it's, it tells kids exactly how they're supposed to act in the classroom. So the S is for sit up, um, the L is for listen, the A is for ask questions, the N is for nod, and the T is for track. So like Joanne, I sense that her attention is directed away from me. <laughs> yeah. um, and and the, the idea is that, that as soon as a teacher has to int interrupt the stream of instruction in order to correct particularly misbehavior. We've got another, you know, we're just that close to the, the burning building. And so, um, so every part of these, the, the, these students' days is slanted. Um, there, there might be some add-ons depending on, on where you are. Um, if anyone um, lives in Connecticut, there's a, a chain of charter schools there that's been getting a lot of attention called Achievement First. And um, they add um, a couple things that I hadn't seen before. In addition to slant, students also are instructed to fold their hands. A lot of concern and focus on the hands. That seems to be a, a locus of troublemaking. And then the younger kids are instructed to puff their cheeks out. <laughs> because that keeps them from talking. And as we know, anyone who's had children or has been around them knows that. Um, children are naturally disruptive, right? So this, um, exactly. So Joanne, I'm going to go ahead and give Joanne a dream dollar, and if she act, if she behaves for the rest of the session, 
she may be able to cash that in later for a piece of cake or a drink. <laughs> so, so those are, um, um, so that's kind of the, the, uh, the, what these schools are like and they're, um, they're now, um, they're opening at an incredible rate, particularly in cities and if you watch the news in the spring and you saw all the, um, the protests in Chicago and, and Philadelphia, a lot of that has to do with the fact that these schools are basically replacing the former public schools. So we've got the system. The great thing is that it works really well. And the people who advocate for it, that um, the elites that I mentioned, um, will often talk about how these schools have cracked the code. Um, Rahm Emanuel loves to talk about how these schools have discovered the secret sauce. He talks about the secret sauce all the time. Um, but the problem is that the, you know, the recipe has a few problems. Um, one of the problems is that this, the level of intervention that's required is really expensive. It's financially very expensive to run um, a school that's going to be open um, nine or ten hours a day uh, beyond. And so these schools tend to require a lot of supplemental investment in addition to their state financing. And so um, they get a lot of money from foundations. The Walton Foundation, which is funded with Walmart profits, is a big driver of these schools. They get a lot of money from um, individual hedge fund managers. It's become the pet cause of the financial industry. So they will often hold um, hold fundraisers and get sort of A-listers in the um, in the fundraise in the uh, hedge fund world. Paul Tudor Jones, Daniel Loeb, and um, they'll donate tons and tons of money to these individual schools. So it costs a lot of money. Um, it's also, you know, it's not so easy on the people who work at these schools. Um, obviously, uh, teaching for, you know, teaching at a school where the school hour is 10 hours a day, uh, many of these schools also require the teachers to be on call in the evening because just because the student is no longer physically in the building doesn't mean that he's not going to need help with homework or potentially make a bad choice, right? And so it means that... Um, you, it means that the population of teachers um, is changing, in some place, cases, very quickly and, and uh, very dramatically. So in a place like New Orleans that went through um, uh, a really dramatic education reform um, experiment, one of the consequences has been that they accidentally eliminated three quarters of the black middle class teachers, which were, they were sort of the anchor of the the African-American middle class in New Orleans. In a place like Chicago, where the ed reform experiment has been going on for 20 years, um, the, uh, the population of, the percentage of African-American teachers has dropped from 45% to 19%. So the new teachers who are coming in are predominantly um, young, white, and temporary. Um, through no fault of their own. They may be very, they may be the most passionate about doing this work in the world, but that's, an, you know, that's a rough, that's a, that's a lot of time to put in. And because the program kind of comes ready-made, you know, there's a, um, there's a, an elaborate discipline structure in, in place, it's not so hard to just plug a brand new teacher in, right? Like all that, all that structure is already there. So it's, it's expensive, it's not so easy on the teachers, but most importantly, this, uh, this kind of education is really rough on the kids. Um, they tend to drop like flies, and one of the things that Ian Frazier failed to mention in that little piece was that Democracy Prep has among the highest attrition rates in New York City. They lose 25% of their students every year. So that 44, um, that the graduating class of 44, the 100% of them are going to college, that's actually the 25% who remain. Um, and this is, this is very common because it's hard, it's, it's a suffocating approach. And we read a lot, you know, there's always, there's an endless debate in the paper about, in the media about, you know, do charter schools push kids out? Do they push out the kids who are harder to teach? Do they push out the English language learners? 
But you know, a lot of it is it's more subtle than pushing out. I hear about so many kids who just break, and they just decide, you know, I can't earn a single another demerit. You know, I can't um, the um, because the the um, because everything is tethered to a disciplinary code. Suspension rates are really really high. Um, so in in Boston, the suspension rate in the public schools is five percent. And in our, what the globe likes to call high-flying charter schools or the high-performing seats, the suspension rate is um, 50%. And that means that the kids attending that school, 50% of them were suspended at least once. But the state doesn't calculate how, how, many, like how many times they were suspended. So you know, we'll have kids that return to the public schools that were suspended 35 times. Because if you're not, if it just doesn't take, right, it's, it's probably not going to take. That's not the place for you. Um, the uh, Achievement First in Connecticut that I mentioned got, um, made a lot of headlines because their suspension rates uh, were extremely high for kindergartners. And so, you know, that they, 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 have to, they have to learn that there are consequences to their action, and there's a whole spectrum um, of punishment, um, so that could include um, you might go to a special room. I think it's the relationship room. Um, you might come back to class wearing a, a white T-shirt over your uniform um, that enables you to continue learning, but it also signals to your classmates that they're not allowed to interact with you. You're ostracized, um, and then you're um, you write. You're supposed to write a letter explaining you know, why you did what you did and that you've learned from your mistakes. And then at this particular chain of schools, which are prominent, fast growing, and extremely well politically connected, the students vote on whether to accept your apology. So, um, so the, these, this particular approach on which we're now in complete agreement is necessary and must be expanded as quickly as possible is really brutal on on the students themselves. So what happens to them? Well, they obviously have to go somewhere, right? And so that uh, leads us to the next consensus, um, which is not talked about as publicly as either number one, which is that everyone must go to college, or number two, that this is the education that poor minority kids need. Um, this is, you'll find education policy people are, have begun to acknowledge this publicly. Um, hedge fund types will talk about it, perhaps later into the evening. Um, and that's the idea that, you know, we tried this whole equity thing. You know, we tried to, we tried to bring up the whole, we tried to raise everybody up, and you know, it didn't work. It, it didn't, it cost so much, we didn't get the results. And so really, the best we can hope for is to do a lot for the strivers. And that's, that's not my word, that's actually... That's their word, the advocates' word, the strivers. And so that's exactly what, for, that's why so many people would see democracy prep as a success story, right? They raised up a small subset of that community, and those kids are going to go to college. And isn't that great? Well, the problem with that is that in, uh, in more and more urban settings, and this is happening pretty rapidly, um, you now have dual competing school systems. And so you'll have a, one a school system of college prep schools and charters that establish their own rules for admission and exit, and the public schools, which are increasingly the schools of last resort. Um, so, you know, in Boston, for example, we're, uh, uh, you know, an uh, uh, immigrant city getting more becoming more of an immigrant city every year. 30% of the kids are in the schools are English language learners. Um, uh, there are, our high-flying charter schools have, you know, as few as 0.4%. And um, so I, you know, I'll, I'll often joke that, you know, they represent a fraction <laughs> of the, the population of kids who are learning English. And by fraction, it's actually a fraction. Because I don't think that even adds up to a whole kid. Um, so <laughs> this is um, this is happening. It's happening quickly, and the balance shifts between these school, two school systems um, 
you know, pretty dramatically. So in uh, in Detroit, for example, where the number of char uh, of college prep schools and more selective charters has skyrocketed, you see that the students who need the most help, um, the percentage of students with special needs starts to skyrocket in the public schools. Um, this became kind of a, uh, a source of debate in Washington because it turned out that the charter schools were expelling, they had an expulsion rate that was, you know, like five times as high as the public schools. And that was when a lot of these groups that are all based in Washington, the education policy think tanks, were, you know, some of them said pretty candidly, well, you know, we have to admit that these schools are not, they're not going to be for everybody, they can't be for everybody, but this is, you know, this is great. At least we're, we're helping the strivers. Um, one of the, there's a last um, consensus, and it actually should have been at the, at the beginning, and that is this, you know, we all agree that there is nothing more important than than our public schools, that they, if we can figure out how to fix them, we will solve poverty. And, you know, this is great. And if anyone saw um, the movie Waiting for Superman, there's a kind of an astonishing moment where um, Davis Guggenheim, who I suspect may be a New Yorker subscriber, um, he kind of theorizes, you know, he's thinking outside the box, and, and he says, and theorizes that, you know, like, what if we've got it all wrong? You know, like, what if the problem with our public schools, the reason that they're, you know, our public schools in high poverty areas, what if the problem isn't that the school reflects the community, but that the school is actually causing poverty? Yeah. Um, and that this happens because the expectations of the teachers, protected by their, by now, 9,000 page union contract, their expectations are so low and the education is so poor that the kids who, you know, are either dropping out and and infecting the neighborhood with their low expectations, um, or they just they come out and they are not call they're frankly not college material. So this was, you know, this really a lot of people when they heard this, it just it blew their minds and they just this kind of caused the whole education reform movement. To, to take flight because it you know it's a really kind of powerful intoxicating thing to be a 26 year old and run one of these schools and be the person who's solving poverty in a way that you commune people or communists um, were unable to do so the schools have never been more important so while democracy prep where we started our field trip um, is remarkable for being so unremarkable among this particular landscape of schools, there is something kind of interesting about it. It's called Democracy Prep for a reason, and it's a small chain of schools. Um, it is run um, by um, a young white guy, with the exception of a few high-profile uh, people. Almost this entire movement and all these schools are run by white people. Um, so he, the reason they have to learn South Korea, they have to learn Korean is that he spent some time in South Korea and was really impressed by what he saw. But he decided that, you know, wouldn't, it would be really cool to take this no excuses um, philosophy, and that's how they identify themselves as a school. What if we took that and melded it with the concept of citizenship? And that in addition to um, being, you know, being put on a path to college, that this school would produce what they call citizen scholars. And I thought, well, you know, that's kind of intriguing. I, I read about this, the American Enterprise Institute, which is deeply, deeply enamored of all of these efforts, um, did a big uh, report about this particular school and the whole movement of, you know, how good this was going to be for our democracy because now we have, um, we have uh, charter schools that are taking citizenship seriously. And I thought, well, this is kind of fascinating because what, like, how do you define citizenship in a, um, in a disciplinary culture where you're not really allowed to talk? And of course, you know, I don't want to exaggerate, especially in the senior years. You know, they have they have back and forth, right? But but there is something about moving through the hallway in straight, silent lines, and then saying, well, you're going to be, you know, uh, um, you're a a citizen. So. 
I noticed the report was fascinating, and I did bring a copy if anybody wants to read it. But I noticed that they were very particular about how they defined citizenship, and they defined it as operational citizenship. Um, and so instead of like the you know the big um, uh, conceptual notion of citizenship that the campers might explore during their seminars, theirs is more focused on concrete actions, say lobbying. <laughs> like lobbying for, say, more charter schools, or taking a bus to Albany to lobby for an end to mayoral term limits, right? Like that's that all sounds really good. So, <laughs> um, and the uh, the head of the school who's leaving leaving this summer, his work is done now that the first. Um, first class has graduated, the American Enterprise Institute asked him, you know, is there, is, is this melding, you know, are, are there any kind of shortfalls? Are there, way, are there areas where your dream of melding uh, citizenship and a no excuse to school have fallen short? And he had a really interesting, um, a really interesting answer. He said that it's very important that the teachers and staff repeat important citizen, citizenship themes to the students over and over and over again, that they make those themes sticky, right? Because that's really the only way that they're gonna take hold um, with the kids. Our, he says, our scholars learn what we teach them, but the really scary part is the corollary. They don't learn what we don't teach them. And, um, you know, when he talks about the fact that they, they um, Many of the school students come from backgrounds and homes where even the most basic civic knowledge, habits, and skills are often lacking. Um, constant repetition um, should gradually start to embed these behaviors and norms into their day-to-day -day lives. Uh, so I thought, you know, that was really interesting. I spend a lot of time in, you know, kind of down at the heels, places in Massachusetts visiting schools, and I'm always so inspired by um, uh, students who've come up through the public schools were success stories, could have gone off and done anything. You know, often they do. Inevitably, it's financial services. And then they come back, and they do something else, and they feel sort of called to help lift their city up. And I just, I think that's, I love that. And so there was something so depressing about a vision that assumes that, that these students are just empty vessels, and they have absolutely nothing to say about the world. And if you watched any of the protests where um, uh, young people poured out into the streets, walked out of their own schools, made poor choices, and um, had protests, and there have been hundreds of these. The big ones have made it on the news, Philadelphia, Chicago, <coughs> New York, but really they're, uh, the, sometimes it's just students walking out of a particular school, and they have absolutely no trouble explaining in, in incredibly clear, um, in incredibly sort of stark terms, what it means that their schools are being closed, that their communities are, that there's no investment in their communities, and the idea that someone would need to stand before them and repeat over and over, make it the lesson sticky, in hopes of embedding a view that someday, you know, when they get up on that stage at the Apollo Theater. So, um, so that was my um, little tour uh, for you through um, No Excuses Land. And if um, anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. And then when we're done, I will tell you very briefly secrets about my camping experience here. <laughs> and, and also, like, sort of what it's meant for me, what cop kind has meant for me personally. But I couldn't quite figure out how to meld those <laughs> two together. Census, a fifth, and that is that you can click here to save everything. And that our entire discourse has now been taken over by young app designers, and they view <laughs> institutions as fundamentally flawed, there are no good institutions, and that their role is to disrupt them. And so 
now there's a certain cadre of young, um, successful uh, um, uh, Silicon Valley people like Mark Zuckerberg, um, like Sheryl Sandberg, who have adopted um, the process of not so much reforming our schools, but really disrupting public education. And it makes for almost, it can make for, it's you know, tragic, but also kind of comic at the same time, which is why I called my talk a farce. But anyone who's worked in anything related to education knows that it's, you know, it's a slow moving beast. And the, um, the problem is that when you bring the mindset of a 20 something guy who, uh, you know, wears sweats and hoodie to work and is an app designer, you're not working on the same timeline. And so they'll take a Silicon Valley um, saying, um, for example, um, fuck it, just ship it. Right, which is like a mantra, and apply it to a school. <laughs> so now, the um, in the last year or so, um, what does there's, that mean? What does that mean? Yeah. It means that you can't just sit around worrying about whether your app is perfect. You know, you go ahead, you deliver it. <laughs> you fix it later. <laughs> you fix it later, right? Like, you don't you don't worry about whether it. And so that like, there's a real there's a whole part of the education reform movement that loves that energy and you know would really like to see the um, the generation that's solving so many of our other problems um, you know like is there is there something on my phone I could use to meet a date in the mountains later like is there could we use some of that um, could we apply that that same um, sense of ingenuity um, so um, for example somebody took um, the kind of algorithmic approach of a dating site and is using it to help schools hire teachers, right? Like, this, this is just great. So the, in the last, year, last couple of years, the Silicon Valley um, group has gotten much more involved in trying to affect the debate in, a, um, in an organized way. So Mark Zuckerberg gave a lot of money to, his, um, to the Newark schools but it came with some strings, came with many, many, many strings. One was that it had to be used to um, change the pay structure and reward the high-performing teachers with merit pay, um, which has, has never worked anywhere, but they will never admit that. Um, it also, there was something funny that the, um, if the, if the um, political leadership of the state changed, that Zuckerberg had the right to take the money back um, so I, I think about that a lot. Um, I read, I got that book, um, Click Here to Save Everything, and I'm blanking on the guy's name. Uh, but he's, uh, he's a young Russian who's really, really critical of how kind of banal the tech discourse is and how many, uh, how many situations that it really just does not apply to at all. And I would say that, that education is one of them, and it's having, it's having kind of a, a dreary and predictable effect. Um, so much of this is driven just by the sheer amount of money that there, if you can figure out how to pay teachers less, because that's where all the money goes, um, you can make a lot of money. And so the emphasis now is all on how can you get the technology into the schools, blended learning, flipped classrooms. Um, I read something yesterday about a concept called accountable. <laughs> accountable remote teachers. <laughs> and so they went, they're, they're, um, they're just teaching by camera. And I'm not really sure what the accountable part is. So, but that, I really recommend um, uh, Click Here to Save Everything. He didn't talk a lot about public education, and somebody needs to write that. It's also moving into higher education, too, with like MOOCs and all Really that. fast. Yeah, so if, if you're um, in, uh, in K through 12 in the suburbs, this is all coming at you. And if you're in higher ed, you've got about a year left. Yes? So what is the model for successful urban schools that um, produce um, successful, successful students with, that don't follow that, that great work? Um, well, I didn't tell you, I didn't say anything about how I got into all of this in the first place. Um, so um, I'll just give you the, the quick version. I came to Copmind. I decided to be a freelance writer. My husband and I decided to buy a house. I needed to get a job. 
the um, one of the teachers unions in Massachusetts was hiring a newspaper editor. Um, I took the job knowing nothing at all about uh, really public education or teachers unions. Um, the union was incredibly <coughs> badly run. It was like a morgue. But it meant that I was totally free to do, to make this, the paper and the job my own. And so I got to visit as many urban schools as I wanted. And from the very beginning, I was fascinated by what was the difference between a school that functioned and functioned on a high level and, and a failure. And I visited so many that I got to the point where when I walked in, I knew. Um, and this was at a time where Massachusetts had a lot of reform experiments going on. And so I got to participate in some of them. And um, I saw that when you had the right combination of really good leadership, um, and leadership that was intent on bringing everybody along as opposed to starting from the position that you need to fire, that the, the problem is in the building and you just need to clear out the dreck. Um, so I saw that that was really possible and that the schools I was going to, you might have 25 different languages. You have kids arriving every day, sometimes just, um, they might have just arrived in the country the day before. and. There are some things that I personally would take from the reform movement. I think the, you know, the high expectations is not the worst thing in the world. But we need to have a broader conversation about what it means to be a successful school in communities that are dead, right? That there's, if there's no functioning institution left in the community, it doesn't seem realistic to expect that the school is going to be that's somehow going to be a gleaming star. Um, one thing that I really hope is that these, in these places like Chicago, um, where as a result of the leadership of the Chicago Teachers Union, there's a whole new generation of teachers that's been really activated and understands the role of their school and their union in such a broader way than teachers did in the past. And they're all working together with community groups, not just to save those schools, you know, the schools were closed, but to redefine what, what public education means at a time where we're an increasingly diverse country and, you know, a public school has to be a school that takes everybody. So there's not a silver bullet, and if anyone tells you there is, they're lying. I would say that, that the number one thing is is uh, is great leadership and it needs to be great leadership at every level it needs to be from the superintendents level down through the principals and they need to set uh, you know you need to have a, everyone needs to believe that they're in this thing together and that's often you know like if you go into a school that's a real dud there's high turnover, people are dropping like flies. Um, um, I'll go in schools and they will have gone through six principals in seven years. That, what, you can't get anywhere with that. Yes? <clears throat> I um, run a restorative justice program in our, in our high school. And I've been doing this for a number of years. One of the things that I've learned that I think the better teachers support is that if you can teach a kid how to resolve conflict, whether it be conflict with a teacher, with a parent, with other kids, you, you solve the majority of the problems that we have, discipline problems in the school. Um, and But yet, if you look in the curriculums of any school, you'd have be hard pressed to find anywhere where there's a course that's teaching kids how to resolve conflict right. in a peaceful, Way. And I'm wondering if, in your experience, anybody's really making a movement that way. I wish they would. I mean, I think you're totally right. I think the discipline issue is just huge. And that you have, right now, you have these two systems where the, the charter schools are fixated on discipline. And the public schools, at least the ones that, that I'm in, have no consistent policy of discipline. And so it means that, you know, like that's not good either. And so there needs to be something, we need an honest conversation about what that means, and I hope the restorative justice people are the ones right. driving. Well, you, you said uh, a consistent policy on discipline, and that's one of the, also one of the mistakes I think, 
is, well, it depends on what you mean by yeah. consistent. I don't really know what I mean. I just know that that's what, when I talk to teachers, what, yeah, that's, that's the thing that makes yeah, Discipline what's... has to be geared towards the kid. Yeah, absolutely. Not towards justice? some rule. What's that? What's restorative justice? Restorative justice means when some problem occurs in school, let's say a kid bullies another kid. Rather than punishing that kid for that, you say, okay, what did you do? How did you affect not only that kid, but how did you affect the whole school community? What was the impact on everybody involved? And then what can you do to correct that behavior or, or correct the harm that you maybe did to somebody? And that's really what restorative is all about. So it's, it's meant to teach. It's meant to somebody learn something. She implied that there is a movement. Is there a movement on this order? Yes, I yeah. mean I think there is a yeah. movement. Um, but it's in communities too, just, Yeah, and it's in communities. Yeah. Too. There's a big movement in the Oakland public schools. Yeah. I just came from the National Historic Yeah, Is there an expert in the room that can actually <laughs> Several people from the Oakland public yeah. schools talking about the work that they've been doing, as well as within San Quentin, yeah. some of the work that's been yes, done there around the whole exactly restorative right. justice process. And yeah. uh, they had some of the, the young people there, right. uh, they had several young people there, uh, not only presenting, but, but talking about their experience with this process. Right. So, but there, so there are some movements, yeah. and I know Brown is one of the. Right, we, we're doing quite a bit there. And, and you know, since I've been in this high school nine years doing this, for a while, our suspend, we talked about suspensions out of school. It was just climbing, 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 getting the words, you know, throw the kid out, throw the kid out. There were problems. And for the first time last year, we started shifting the other way. We started the number of suspensions decreasing. And to me, that's, that shows, that's really great. you know, there is a way. There is a way to deal with this in a different way. But it, it takes a tremendous shift. And the majority of parents, I would say, Let's say a kid is bullied. Nowadays, the emphasis is so much on, oh my God, you bully a kid, the kid commits suicide, you know, the school gets sued, it's an awful thing, and it is an awful thing. And it's hard for parents to accept not punishing. Right. You know, punishing is just, and the punishing, part of punishing is throw the kid out of school. Dottie? Well, I was about to say that, um, we're dealing with several things. One, we're in an individualistic society, so right. when you make a mistake, it's your mistake. Right. Whereas the George Story of Justice basically says that the community it's is right. now. And, and, and I think that that's the problem with no excuses, yeah. because there are multiple contributing factors to why a child doesn't perform well in school that's beyond just a straight line on the floor and uh, you know puffing out your cheeks. Um, and I think that's, that's the part of, if we only do that, then we're basically you know, that one quarter, when you said that, I was thinking, well, that's no better than public school, so is that a successful school? It's actually in my better than most New York City's public schools. Okay. So that's actually one quarter. Better. Yeah. One well, quarter what? I mean, and we should be cheering about well, one quarter. But that, see, the problem with that is that you're comparing a school to an entire district. district. So that's, you know, like you're in, that's problem right there. But the point I wanted to make is that if we continue to look at education in isolation, we won't get right. into it. We have to see how it's interrelated with everything from the prison industrial complex to the military industrial complex and look at all of those things and how they're interweaving. And I think that a lot of those students are perfect examples of how we are just feeding the prisons because then there's more investment into private prisons now. The private prisons, you need customers. If you have people who can think, think about it. Yeah. Because that form of education does not allow people Thing. If I'm a just started you like you're an empty vessel, I'm basically engaging in a, a form of control. Not and thinking is the the, the, the the core of innovation. If I'm not thinking, because you're feeding me, because you're teaching me, you know, what do I do when I go to college where you don't have the lines on the ground or right. somebody telling you it's time to go to class? And that's um I didn't mention that, but the you know the other part of the story is that these so far these schools have not been successful at um, producing at kids who can graduate from college. Partly because of that, partly because it's such a shock to the system that there's no structure. But the problem, the overwhelming, the reason that most people drop out of school is because of money. And these kids go to college and they're still poor, right? Like that hasn't been. And so there's a more and more elaborate effort to kind of cushion a particular subset of 
of students. So KIPP now has relationships with individual college colleges that will make sure that these kids get, not just get to college, but once they're there, they're surrounded with all sorts of support services um, and, uh, you know, counselors, and that's great. But as the investment rises, the number of kids that can actually benefit gets smaller and smaller. And then you might end up, um, you know, having to eliminate at a district level a program that's actually helping lots of kids go to college. So, yes. How much of this is uh, a crony capitalism gone amok? The, uh, I mean, it's harder and harder for corporations to make money from the, the mass of people who don't have much uh, disposable income. And uh, I hear about Arnie Duncan going to uh, the Aspen Institute and telling people that uh, education investment in private corporations are really good investments. Right. And, uh, you know, are these people just talking a good game and really in it for the money? There, um, there's kind of there's a whole spectrum. So you have you have a lot of people who are in this for the absolutely heartfelt reasons, right? That they really, you know, they, they really want to improve education, and this is a calling. But there is a lot of money to be made. There's money to be made in building charter schools. You're eligible for a new market tax credit. That's part of the reason why the hedge fund guys are so excited. Um, the big money right now is in who can get technology. Um, into the schools, not just to sell the actual gizmo, but because the calculation is that if you could replace um, uh, teachers with, you know, if you can replace teachers with laptops, um, class sizes can get bigger, but it won't necessarily matter so much. So I, you know, when you read about somebody's great idea, do a little calculation. Does it, have they figured out a way that's actually going to drive down the cost of, of of teaching, and that's almost always what it is. Yes? So, two things. One, a little anecdote just occurred to me as you were talking, um, that was really disturbing when I heard it. In um, Arizona, on the border in Yuma, uh, I think it's in the Yuma School District, uh, I visited a school because there was a small conference there, and so the principal of the school, I think, or the assistant superintendent came and spoke, and talked about everyone at this particular school has a laptop and they no longer have textbooks that they take home. But they can't take the laptop home. Yeah. And, um, and a lot, and no, I take that, I'm so sorry. They, they can take the laptop home, but a lot of these kids, this is Yuma, Arizona, right? So this is an agricultural farm worker community. Etc. A lot of the kids don't have internet access right. at home. Yeah. So they literally, to get their homework done, have to go to the parking lot of the schools and finish their homework right. on their laptop in the parking lot, like in their parents' car. Parents have a and, and yet, as he was saying this, he actually told us this, right? That, oh, the kids are so determined, they'll drive back after <laughs> school and do their homework in the parking lot. And I thought, there's something really unsettling about this, right? There's something really contorted about this because, and I have a 10 year old daughter, if my daughter had to go to the parking lot, if we had to drive her there, and I could afford to do that, and I have a DC car, and as a, I would not want it, it's just not conducive educational environment for me, right? So that's, that's one thing. And then the other thing is just a general observation that I think this probably happened to all of us on some level, that the most effective education I've ever gotten in my life were from teachers who care about me. I, I don't even remember what school they went to, I don't remember, I don't know, but they cared about me. Right? And I think that that's the problem with these formulaic kind of charter school structures sometimes is that it sort of sets that aside. It says, here's a list of rules. And if we can follow these guidelines, we can have effective schools. But people aren't really talking about, does the teacher care about that child? Well, and it may be the case that the teacher cares passionately to the utmost about the child. But turnover is so high, right? The charter schools in Boston lose a third of their teachers every year. Um, some of them lose, uh, lose half of their teachers every year. Um, uh, Teach for America now places the majority of its core members in these charter schools because they're kind of a natural um, supply. The, the core members want to teach for two years. The charter schools can, can handle it. But it's like if you're, if it's only a two-year job, you know, like, well, that caring could be really, really intense for the two years. But it is totally different than what you're talking about. Yeah. So what are te the teachers for these schools, are they coming from uh, teacher training schools? Are they coming from just no, they are primarily, um, they're coming from what is referred to in short, well, they're alternative certification programs. Okay. So in uh, Boston now we have a 
graduate program that's just for to mint charter school teachers. And the thinking is that you know if you're if if this is the kind of teaching you're going to be doing, you need to learn slant, right? You need to learn um, classroom ma these particular classroom management techniques, and then you can potentially teach at. You know, we currently have six thousand students in Boston who attend these schools. Um, it's a matter of minutes before they eliminate the cap on charter schools, so half of our schools will be these charter schools. They burn through so many of the teachers; they need their own. Um, they need their own uh, graduate school. But that's why the new terrain in this debate is all about teacher preparation. So, what are the teachers? That it's kind of all over the place. Um, the starting salary might be really good, but because they stay for such a short time, they never reach the top of the, the pay scale. And then, you know, we I've been talking about the high achieving schools, but there's another subset which really basically says we can do the same crappy job the public schools do, but we're gonna do it for cheaper. So in Michigan, for example, where they've had a couple of districts where they've just handed over the whole um, uh, district to a charter operator, and the teaching salary dropped from 63000 to 32000 in a year. And I was curious, so I just went to their website. You know, they had a whole tab, benefits. <laughs> so I clicked on it, and the benefits were great. Um, workers' comp, um, social security, <laughs> um, um, something related to like a, bur a burial leave. Um, you got a pension. If you were in a state, that, that had a pension system you were eligible for. So, so that's actually, like, people don't really talk about that, but that's a pretty fast growing. These states where, they're, um, where there's no industry and the tax base is dried up, there's going to be a big push to just say, you know what, well, these, like, we might as well, if, you know, if, we'll, we'll give the private contractor the, the option. And then, of course, the, you know, the kids that are more expensive to educate, they go somewhere else. We don't really know where. Yeah. So we talked at dinner, we chatted a little bit about um, the connection between this whole phenomenon and, and immigration, because so many of these students yeah. are immigrants. And I wonder if you could just elaborate on the potential for um, young immigration activists to join with education activists on this issue. Um, it's definitely having, happening some places, and I really hope that it happens more. Um, so much of this depends on where you are and what the particular demographic of your your school district is. But you know, in Boston, for example, where our public schools are are so much have so many more English language learners, those um, uh, young immigrant activists have been a really powerful voice. In fact, really the only voice against the corporate funded um, reform movement. So last year, Stand for Children. Um, placed a uh, question on the Massachusetts ballot that would um, prohibit schools from taking into account teacher experience in layoffs. Um, that it, they could only use uh, a score, one through five score, on the new state evaluation um, system. So the the uh, the unions were like they didn't really understand. It was you know they, they didn't know how to explain what was going on. But it was really the immigrant organizations that understood exactly what this was about, and that public education is incredibly important, and they're broadening that conversation. And I think that when the different organizations start to come together in Chicago, and the conversation moves beyond just school and into prison pipeline and possibility, I think it has real, you know, real, real potential. So I I have my fingers very much crossed for that. On the flip side too, a lot of the Silicon Valley, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, they're all getting on immigration reform at the same time that they're trying to get into public schools as well. It's so true. Two forces battling. Over it's true. Just, they tend to their um, idea of immigration reform tends to be they like the um, HB one yeah. high skill the high yeah. Skilled yeah. So that's From Mark Zuckerberg. Yeah. Well, they yeah. Can pay cheap. Yes. Are you familiar with General Electric's uh, management theories? Six Sigma? No, their theory of, of, that Jack Welch started uh, <laughs> about that ten percent of the people yes. have to go yeah. every year. You know, and uh, well, I have personal experience with GE managers on my job when I was working at the railroad, and and uh, the, this whole and it, it sort of ties in with television shows, Survivor, voting off the island. Yeah. When you describe <laughs> And when you describe what they're doing to these kids in these schools, you know, whether you're, where you wear the shaming T-shirt and 
people have to vote whether yeah. you uh, are acceptable or not. It sounded very much like, you know, that what they're trying to do is dr drive this this philosophy that's starting at the very top of corporate America right down into the lower echelons yeah. of the of, of the population to create people who basically don't don't question anything. And and that was my experience with the run of the mill GE manager that they they came through our shop. They didn't know anything about locomotives. We had to train them. You know, but that didn't matter because they knew they supposedly knew something about managing. That was all that they cared about. You know, and and uh, real knowledge. Yeah. You know, uh, they knew how to behave. You knew how to behave as a GE manager. That was the key. Right. And yeah. if you didn't, and if you didn't say how high, they told you how to jump. Right. Bye bye. I think I think you're totally right. The, um, a big. Um, in addition to the, the hedge fund managers playing an outsized role in all of this and the Silicon Valley people, um, the other, um, it's also being driven by these big consulting firms. Um, you know, the head of Teach for America now is a McKinsey person. Uh, Boston Consulting is the group that wrote the plan to close all the Philadelphia schools. And so they do, they bring a particular kind of management theory and churn is a big part of it. So. You know, and it, there's not that, I'm not sure people really know that much about it. I hope they learn. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, kind of along the same lines is this inflation of necessary credentials. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, I've seen job listings for stock clerks that require high school diplomas. And I don't really understand why. Right. You know, um, huh? That's a bad that you could get through and do something. I, I mean, no, no, I mean, my first paid job was working, you know, as a 15-year-old in Kmart. You know, I didn't have a high school diploma yet. I was working on it. You know, why would, why should you need a high school diploma to do that? Because then you can be discriminated against without being discriminated against. I mean, right. but I mean, it goes more with your what you said about. Okay, everybody needs to go to college. No, not every. Right. Actually, I yeah. make about the same amount of money now as I did before. <laughs> yeah. I got my high, my uh, college diploma, mm -hmm. which I got in 2008. <laughs> you know, and I went through um, Connecticut public schools, which have been taken over by the state now. Are you from Bridgeport? I'm from Waterbury. And um, you know, a court. We started out with 250 students in freshman year. We grad. You know, 400 students freshman year. We graduated 150. Wow. wow. You know, and so there was there's some alternative um, adult ed for high school. At, at, there was at that time in '94. Um, but you know, my friends who dropped out, they're not homeless. They're fine. You know, they're, they're working. <laughs> well, well, they're probably not saddled with debt, right? Not bad, Huh? They're probably not saddled with debt either. Right, and they have houses, and I don't. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but they're you know garbage collectors and mechanics, and um, they you know not all of them, but some, you know some of them they just there's no value I think anymore in blue collar jobs. Right. And there's an overvaluation of these extremes uh -huh. of academic credentials. Have you ever thought about designing apps for a living? <laughs> <laughs> You're very popular. I mean, I thought 25 percent is. I mean, if, even if you compare other Harlem schools, yeah, 25 percent is pretty good, actually. Yeah. So for these, for like non, like I want to know where people send their, like, where like these rich people send their kids that aren't private, like private schools, like are expensive. Mm -hmm. but there's like I know like Berkeley High, for example, like mm -hmm. you know people will like send their kids to like. Private school through eighth grade and then to the Berkeley High School right. because they know that that's like a college prep public school. But like, yeah. is there like a parallel, like private school, public school system that mirrors like, that has like more like I don't know old school philosophies of teaching that aren't as like draconian and well, um, like, so um, I have this blog where I write about this stuff all the time and I wrote about this last week after I read this piece by Ian Fraser and somebody wrote to me and said, you know, I know where Ian Fraser sends his kids. Mm -hmm. And it's to a public school in New York, and it's the most Montessori-like, you know, in the in the city. The kids are free to be, <laughs> you know, and me. And um, and so in um, in in um, affluent communities, um, the um, where the parents are are very involved, often overly involved. 
you'll have uh, you know public schools that look more like private schools. Um, the um, corporate reform movement never mentions the fact that the inequities in our system are based on the fact that our schools are funded by property tax. Mm -hmm. So um, I live down one the town down uh, down the road from me, Manchester by the Sea. The, um, the school is, schools are like private schools. Um, the parents are incredibly involved. They have you know, world class, chess teams, lacrosse, like anything you can think of. Um, and then you know, I would drive, I would leave there and I would go to Lawrence, which is 95% uh, Dominican, um, old mill town, mills left you know, uh, 100 years ago. And um, they, their schools have, have nothing. When, the, um, when they wanted to put on a play and have an orchestra, the, music teacher had to recruit his friends from all over the state to come and bring their instruments. Um, and so the, you know, like that's a big problem too, that they're just, the fact that our schools are funded in an inequitable way means that kids have completely different experiences. You know, there's an opportunity gap, so. Yeah. Um, how much are the schools uh, are the same people who are pushing for this corporate reform movement also pushing for National standardized testing—is there an overlap there? Good, excellent question. Um, yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> the most, you know, we didn't—we I didn't mention that at all. But the other really interesting thing about the moment that we're in is that there's a major backlash brewing against uh, standardized testing and how excessive it is, and even the Times and an utterly incoherent editorial today <laughs> had to acknowledge that there's too much testing. And you know, the problem is that these newspapers more and more are, are the newspaper part is failing, but it's married to an education company, right? So like Washington Post is married to Kaplan. Um, and so they, you know, like their profits come from things like standardized testing. And so, you know, because they tend to love standardized testing. But, you know, in Texas, there was a major populist uprising against testing. They were able to push the legislators to dramatically reduce the number of tests. Um, it's the one issue that cuts across every single demographic. And even, you know, teachers who go into charter schools, they don't like the fact that it's, you know, they have to do this sort of drill and kill stuff. or you know that a, a high performing charter school has 0% proficiency in science because all the emphasis is on math and English. So I think that's potentially explosive. This uh, common core stuff, this new national curriculum, there's a major backlash on the right and the left. Um, and so that's also... What's that? Um, the, so it's, does it, is anyone here? Interested in the Common Core? You want to talk? Do you want to talk about what it is? Why not? It makes me very sleepy. Yeah. <laughs> it's, just, it's just a national movement to make sure when kids graduate from high school, they are ready for college or the workplace. Because there's been, been a big gap. Kids come out of high school, they go to college, and everybody goes, "Oh my God, they all have to take remedial courses and they're not ready." So this is an effort to shore up the public schools so when they graduate, they're college ready. Yeah, but how is that different from the testing program we had before, the No Child? Uh, it wasn't a curriculum. curriculum. It's a curriculum, and well, it's, 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 it's standards yeah. curriculum, and it's extremely rigorous, and it puts a very high value on critical thinking. And No Child Left Behind was passed under this rubric of instituting some sort of common course and sort of standard right. across the yeah. country. So it, it's part of the same. It's, it's, it's the same. same. It's yeah. Yeah. But everybody yeah. reads the same book, right? That's the idea. I mean, no, 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 um, no, but the standards are national. There's a there. So there's uh, um, wherever you go to school in any part of the country, these are the standards you have to meet. But it's up to the um, it's up to the individual state to determine the curriculum, and the whole thing is incredibly politicized. So everybody will take everybody in the whole country will take the same test. Right. Yeah. So that's what's coming. Well, yeah. Go ahead. No. Joanne? Well, but isn't this whole thing to some extent like just a huge diversion? I mean, kind of like the whole attention to the public schools and the whole obsession with the schools and the schools failing and the children failing and how we can test them and how we can regulate them and how we can march them around and how we can get them to college. I mean, it it's sort of like shoving shit against the tide, you know? Yeah. The tide is 
that there are no jobs, right. there is exactly. no money, the communities are falling apart, right. there is no future, and nobody has a clue right. what that future is or what these kids are going to do. So why not just kind of like make the little bit of freedom and childhood that they have as miserable as possible, unless of course there are children who are going to lead the world, right. lead what's yeah. left amid, amid the wreckage. Right. <laughs> I, I would say that you're I, that you're absolutely right, and that there's um, you know there are all these there's all this talk about ladders to prosperity, but they never admit that all the jobs are gone and that the unions are gone and. You know, Walmart spends, when I looked at, you, they're very proud of the amount of money they spend on this movement. Mm -hmm. Opening individual schools, paying education reform organizations, hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. And, um, uh, you know, like clearly they have a particular interest in it, in this, and it's not in, in grooming the next generation of professors, mm -hmm. right? Um, so yeah, I would say that, I would say that, that what you're saying is correct, even though you know it's somewhat depressing of a view. The, and the other thing, and this relates to the the Common Core, is that more and more, um, you know, our businessmen are genius. We all acknowledge this. They are superior in everything that they do, and that's why it makes so much sense that they should come together and decide what kind of what kids need to learn. Um, and so the problem is, if you read these guys, their vision is so cramped and dumb and so um, the, a lot of the the, um, the education choice movement comes straight out of Milton Friedman you know who he is so um, I'm drawn to the uh, the most lunatic aspects of the movement so I, I found this charter in uh, Utah it was on NPR and they're raising the next generation of entrepreneurs and I thought isn't this great and so they have a little store, and the kids work at the store, and um, the kids learn all sorts of uh, real-world skills that they'll need to survive, or to thrive in the 21st century economy, like PowerPoint. Isn't that so exciting? And that they'll leave the school with a, um, a resume ready to go, and that I thought, what a vision. <laughs> so broad. Yeah. I just have a quick comment that, um, so the Teach for America, there was recently a story somewhere that I read, they recruit from business schools. Like they basically, what they want are these teachers who are teaching these two-year contracts to go and work for these hedge funds and the investment banks, and have connections with these schools and these kids. And they're going to like get them the kindergartner that they taught, you know, 12 years ago. They're going to give them a job, you know, an entry-level job or something like that, you know? Um, I've never seen that. That's yeah. kind of interesting. Yeah, the, the, they're not recruiting just anybody for teacher. No. They're, no. Te they're recruiting business majors. Mm -hmm. They also have, um, um, their mission changed. Their original mission when Wendy Kopp started it um, was to recruit the best, the best and the brightest and send them in to fill, um, hard to fill spots or send them to places where they didn't have enough teachers. But then, you know, the economy collapsed. And so a place like Clark County, Nevada, where um, Las Vegas is, that was hiring 2,000 teachers a, a year, um, you know, in the, the height of the excess, is now laying people off. And so, you know, they continue to, you know, place people in hard to place areas. But their real mission now is to produce educational reform leaders. And so the idea is that you would take your two years and then you would go, the, you know, there's a huge chunk who go to Yale Law School. And then you'll come out and you'll lead. And so you'll be a Michelle Ree, you'll be uh, the superintendent in Tennessee. Um, and there, that's why, uh, you know, the Walton Foundation gives them, has given them $100 million because of the leaders, not because of the teachers. Right. Yeah. I just add to that, I mean, I think that was actually always part of Wendy Kopp's vision. Like when she first started yeah. being the idea and her, like, you know, her bachelor's thesis at Princeton, like, her idea was to have this sort of like initial operational benefit of solving the teacher shortage, and that. But the idea is that right. the, the idea behind a two-year term is that with the Peace Corps, which is like you sort of uh, you know get a taste of real-world experience, and then it looks great on your campaign trails, you know, stump speech or whatever. If you work in the public schools, right. and then you can then ascend to policy-making circles, and then sort of you know like pour around your teaching credentials as like part of your grassroots kind of connection. So that's I get, um, I have this blog that I do called Edu Shyster, 
and I'm you know sort of documenting from a comic with a comic lens all this different stuff. So people send me stuff from all over the country. So one somebody sent me um, a thing that Yale Law School now gets so many applications from Teach for America Corps members that they have what they call TFA essay fatigue, and they went through and they described. <laughs> The, you know, like all the components, you know, the, the high hopes and expectations, you know, the inevitable reality, the one student that confounded them, um, you know, how they went, they, uh, you know, they laid it all out there in order to help her, how they realized that teaching, you know, like teaching wasn't for them, they were ready to, to bring about change, reform, and disruption on a bigger scale, and that's why they needed to go to Yale Law School. Yeah, and then we should move yeah. along. Well, when I started teaching, the first place I taught, we were, we were trying to solve racism by integrating schools. Yeah. Now, there were lots of other things you might have done about racism, but they decided, someone decided that doing it in the schools was where it really, really was going to make a difference. And it seems like a lot of this is, is sort of solving, solving poverty by, through the schools, too. And, right. and uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't go backwards to the families. But Kay and I visited this last year. We went down to place where the uh, AFT, the uh, American Federation of Teachers, is doing an experiment in McDowell County, yeah. uh, West Virginia, the poorest county in America. We drove down there to sort of see what was going on. And, you know, <laughs> there's nothing nothing for them to do there. There's absolutely nothing. If you want to look what the, the future that you're describing is like, it's this coal mining communities where coal now, the natural gas is taking over coal and, and the brooks are running black with soot from the uh, whatever coal mining is still going on there. And I don't know what the AFT is going to do, but it'll be fascinating to watch if, I mean, maybe they'll buy them all bus tickets out of, out of the state or something. But, uh. It was a really cool um, project. And, you know, in most communities, the teachers are the largest organized group. And so if they actually got their act together and had a broader vision, it could really mean something. And in West Virginia, they decided that rather than try to break the union, it would bring the union in as a... Um, a partner along with all these community organizations because it was the largest organized group and see if they could solve some of these problems. Um, I thought it was really interesting. I read a lot about it. I haven't heard anything about it for yeah, a while, which kind of makes me think Anyway, I didn't that. see Bill Gates down there. Or no, he didn't go down there. So. <laughs> um, and I just wanted to say just a word about coming to CopKind. I came here 15 years ago. It was magical. Um, I um, uh, made friends that continue to be close friends today including Joanne, who I know fondly as big sister. Um, I thought that it was just a magical um, opportunity to think about not just the work that we were engaged in, but also like how to, how to live a particular kind of life. And I've always tried to bring together activism, writing, and humor. And going to CopKind really helped me. It was one step along that that path, and I'm so glad that it's still here 15 years later, um, and that that John is going to resurrect my particular camping year, which had been erased from history due to a few incidents. It was called pre-K. Pre-K. So we're gonna have to go back to K one. So, since you're such. Let's go outside and have a drink. <laughs> <laughs>